We've all experienced odd coincidences. Thinking of someone the moment before they text, getting a new car and then suddenly seeing it everywhere, hearing a song that perfectly describes your mood. But sometimes, these seemingly random alignments aren't just a little weird, they're downright bizarre. Today, we're talking about synchronicity. <laughs> Welcome to Shadowland, everybody. Welcome. This is a podcast that shines a spotlight on stories of the supernatural, mysterious, eerie, and unexplained. Stuff like visions. Bigfoots. Angels. Elves. I was going to say elves. Stargates. Telepathy. <laughs> visions. Hauntings at sea. I just said visions. <laughs> <laughs> We're okay. in sync. We're in sync. <laughs> Synchronicity. <laughs> Astral Which, projection. Zombies. Ghost ships. Poltergeists. Trolls. You get the idea. Yeah. That was a lot that time. <laughs> <laughs> we're getting better. <laughs> we're getting better. So today, um, we're doing something that's a little bit different because we're kind of going into more fringe science territory, and we're going to be doing synchronicity. Yeah, Synchronicity. Um, so do we, before we jump in, do we want to introduce ourselves? Yes, I'm Christina Callery. And I'm Seth Jablon. And yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, synchronicity today. It's one we've been talking about, kind of doing from, since we started talking about doing this podcast, right? Yes, definitely. And now we're doing it, so. And I think it'll be a bit of an experiment, right? Like normally we do these like sort of like sp specific long stories and now we're going to be maybe doing a bit, bit more of a discussion or I know you have a story I'm not sure what you're doing I actually have two stories you have two stories okay good. I have two stories and I am so excited because like these stories are really cool good good well I'm excited to hear them okay um and I, yeah, I don't good. know about you but like I I know I've had so many experiences uh with synchronicity same yeah I think that's like one of the most common kind of paranormally things that I think everybody experiences them. Yeah, I think so too. I think it's like definitely up there with like deja vu, right? It's yes. a similar type yes. of feeling and, and, um, you know, occurrence, but, but often it happens outside of you or like, you know, it's something that people can witness. Whereas I feel like deja vu is something you like, kind of like it's you experience just for yourself, but, yeah. um, cool. So, um, do you want to go first? I, I was okay, thinking about I just, going first. I know you want to go first. <laughs> Seth has like been going so first the whole time. The whole okay, time. I thought so, you went first the first time. And maybe, second maybe. Time. Okay. Well, anyway, so I'm, who's keeping score? I am well, a little are. bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, I, I um, promise the next couple times. Okay, I I'll go first to, next time. Okay. Yeah, you need to set it up. I, just I feel like you've got a up. handle on this. Yeah, okay, I should have, go for it. I should have had you go first last time. I made, um, but um, it's it's totally it's okay. A, it's all right. It's all right. Okay. Um, cool. So, I mean, just you know, I imagine most people have an idea um, what synchronicity is, but um, just to start off with, like describing it, right? So it's often described as a temporally coincidence occurrences of a causal events or mm. so, or sometimes a meaningful coincidence in time and those those last That's how I've heard it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And that last bit was um was Young's one of Young's uh definitions. So um again for those who don't know uh synchronicity was first coined by one of the fathers of modern psychology, Carl Jung. Um he was a Swiss psychiatrist. Um he founded analytical psychology uh, he was also a collaborator with uh, Freud for many years um, before they eventually parted ways. I think because it was just like Freud was too obsessed with sex, right? Yes, that's, yeah, exactly. He thought it was weird that Freud literally thought everything was about sex. And also, I think well, he, It was weird. It was weird. He was like, he was as obsessed with sex as he thought everyone else was. <laughs> but Jung thought that there was more to, to psychology and that there was more, um, you know, in terms of spirituality, he thought... Freud sort of stopped there. And I think Jung continued beyond just the sort of, um, you know, the sort of uh, Freudian perspective. Although Freud um, did kind of buy into some of the stuff 
Um, he actually thought that, and we can do this in another episode, but sure. that sleeping kind of primed you for telepathy. Really? Like the sleep state was the most conducive to having a telepathic experience. Huh. I haven't heard that before. That's interesting. Yeah, maybe we should definitely do an episode on telepathy. For sure. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think even though Jung's uh, contribution to modern psychology is massive, right, including his work on, like, the personal unconscious and, like, the personal mythology, right, like, he even made his own, uh, called the Red Book, I don't know if you ever saw that, but um, it's pretty, no. yeah, he basically made, like, an illuminated manuscript of his, it's giant, uh, of his, um, uh, of his, like, sort of personal mythology, all the sort of symbolism he saw in his dreams and um, it's very beautiful, actually. He was actually kind of an artist, too. Like, he did a lot of watercolors and sculptures and stuff. But um, he also did a lot of dream interpretation. Clown paintings. Clown paintings. <laughs> what? I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> I, you had me for a second. Um, and he did a lot of stuff on archetypes and stuff. But I think the thing he is definitely, the idea maybe that um, has made its way into pop culture the most is synchronicity, right? And I think, I don't know. Maybe it's the police song that did that. I don't know if, like, they hadn't have done that song, if, like, if it would have had the same thing. Maybe now I feel like a lot of these idea, these types of ideas are coming back around, but um, just a theory. But blame Sting. Blame Sting thing. for all those things. Um, so, um, so when Jung was sort of conceiving or, or, or coining the, this, this idea of synchronicity, um, I don't know if this is the event. I think there was a number of events that actually made him um, sort of articulate this idea. Um, but the one that he relates, he actually relates two stories in the, um, the I guess it's an essay. Um, it's a very long one, but it's um, an essay about synchronicity. And so he recounts these two different stories. I'm just going to tell one of them. Um, so basically the story is that he was um, in his office listening to this young woman who he was treating uh, relaying a story, uh, a dream to him. And so in this dream, at this critical moment, uh, someone in her dream gives her this golden scarab, right? And then, you know, um, golden scarabs were like a, they're like, kind of like a type of pin or brooch that was obviously more fashionable at that time. Um, but I think that they, they have sort of an ancient origin in terms of like, Yeah, in ancient Egypt. Yeah, exactly. Um, so as he recounted later, um, she was caught up in her retelling of the dream and, you know, she's kind of, I think the way he described her a few different places was, you know, she was sort of overly rational, overly intellectual, and she was sort of caught up in this um, kind of intellectual, what I would call sort of manipulative mental loop, right? You know, you've, you've heard people sort of go, go on and on con convincing themselves of something and you kind of can't break into that, you know? And so his criticism of her when he was trying to treat her is that she was too, um, she was too in, sort of smart for her own, her own good, right? She always sort of thought that she knew better. And so it was very difficult to get her to see outside of the, sort of her rational mind, right? He was growing frustrated with her treatment and feeling like she was stuck and that he was stuck. He didn't really know how to help her. Um, and he actually even described her as psychologically uh, inaccessible, Um so basically, he just, he confined himself to the hope that something unexpected or irrational would turn up and break through this sort of rationalism that she had sealed herself into. Um, so as he sat there listening to her dream, uh, his back was to the window, and he heard something behind him gently tapping at the glass. He turns around, and he sees this large flying insect that was like literally knocking on the window <laughs> with like one of its little legs, trying to get inside. Let me in. Yeah, exactly. Um, so he goes over the window, opens it. As soon as he does that, the bug flies in, and he immediately snatches it um, into his hand out of the air. And so he looks down at his hand, and it's a uh, scarabied beetle. Scarab beetle. And it's, it has this sort of gold green color. If you look it up, it, we'll, we'll put it on the um, Instagram. But um, it's this gold green color. So it looks like a golden scarab, basically related to them pretty much a similar type of insect um so he hands so he walks over to the young woman puts the beetle in her hand and says here's your scarab and so as he um as he later describes it this punctures a hole in her rationalism and it totally broke the ice of her sort of resistance and from then on she had this major breakthrough where she kind of wow. like 
Yeah, just sort of broke a road. So there was a reason, like like there's actually, it served a function. It served a function, yeah. And we can, we'll talk about that more in a second. But um, I mean, it's interesting to think about whether this was a moment of synchronicity for her or for him or for both of them. Um, but, you know, you, it's, it's certainly hard to imagine that if she might not have had the you know same experience with a different uh, psychologist. Um, but it definitely obviously had to do with her, right? It's a symbol that she had in her dream and, and here it is on her doorstep. Right. Um, there's another sort of level of symbolism in this event that's worth pointing out, and that is that, uh, as you mentioned earlier, the scarab beetles, it's an Egyptian symbol, and it's a symbol for transformation. So not only is it a, a meaningful coincidence that this thing, wow. you know, that's in her dream shows up at, at the window, right? That that in and of itself is a meaningful coincidence, but that um, it, it, it's it's involved in this moment of breakthrough for her, but it's also this very powerful symbol of rebirth itself, right? It's very poetic. Yeah, isn't it? Like, so the scarab beetle, um, it's also called the dung beetle because it like basically rolls up these balls of dung uh, and eventually plants its young into into it, right? And so um, the idea is that it sort of like rises again. It, it's sort of reborn from this ball of shit like a phoenix, <laughs> right? And so it's, it's the symbol of transformation. And so it was a symbol in her dream, but it was also like actually appeared in her life and played, like you said, this function of actually sort of cracking her open. And so, you know, Jung gives this uh, as, I think, you know, sort of a quintessential example of synchronicity. Um, so he also describes synchronicity as happening in three categories. Um, and I'm, I'm obviously paraphrasing these, but um, the first one's about a simultaneous event, right? Where what's happening inside and what's happening outside coincide, right? like the one in the story I just sort of read. Um, the second two happen is about um, uh, uh, events either A, sort of happening simultaneously, but outside of the observer's view, like you find out later that at that very moment, such and such was happening, mm -hmm. or it's about something that's going to take place in the future, such as like things like clairvoyance. He put uh, telepathy, ESP, he put all that into the category. Dreams, Dreams, yeah. exactly, premonitions. And so here's a bit of synchronicity, an example right now. Um, uh, so when he goes to illustrate the third category, uh, guess what he uses as an example? What? Air Marshal Sir Victor Goddard. No! <laughs> yeah, isn't that crazy? <gasps> oh my God. I literally just read that today. I mean, I read synchronicity like 20 years ago. Isn't that crazy? Okay, so... That's so definitely people, synchronicity. Right, if you... If you didn't listen to our last podcast Seth actually did that person yep and I and that he was specifically referring to the dream that the guy had that um that uh you know was a premonition of his plane crashing and and I, in, in the in the copy of the uh, synchronicity that I had there's even an editor's note about like such and such happened in that movie when you're um, what is it called when your bell tolls or whatever? <laughs> like he even mentions that movie that we talked about. So that's pretty crazy, right? Like that's that's certainly a, a bit of meaningful coincidence. Oh, that's that is very crazy. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So I mean, you know, th those are you know obviously there's a lot of people have talked about synchronicity and you right know, and have different theory. There are different, different theories, theories behind it. I was just gonna say like maybe yeah. we should like kind of like talk a little bit about like what what some people's theories are. I don't know if you want to wait till after my stories. Do you, do you have more? Do you have well, anything? I'll just add this one, okay. one part and then we'll, we'll come back to it. Like, I think that um, syn synchronicity itself, you know, goes far beyond like sort of a meaningful coincidence, whether it's symbolic or otherwise. And um, I mean, if you know Julia Cameron, the um, woman who wrote uh, The Artist's Way, she talks a lot about synchronicity and she describes it as the net appearing for you when you jump, right? <laughs> right? That it's a response from the universe when you start pursuing something in a meaningful way. So when I was out on the internet, like doing my research and stuff, she said, uh, I, I found a quote that said, um, it's not her, but um, synchronicity is the universe saying um, yes to you, right? And sounds mm -hmm. like kind of a Tumblr platitude. <laughs> or something yeah, too, like so image, it's but, getting a little into like secret but, territory. But I think that's, I think there's some truth to that, right? Like th there mm -hmm. is that idea that like, you know, um, like she describes it when you that that idea of like you know you leap and the net will appear that's another formulation of this idea of synchronicity 
Yeah. So. But yeah, let's. Um, let, let, so you want to tell your stories and then. And then we'll, we can talk about it. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. So um, I'll just try and get through these really quickly. But I, I was, I'm super excited to share them. I think they're pretty cool. Um, so the first one um, takes place in 1950. Uh, the West Side Baptist Church in Beatrice, Nebraska, had 15 choir members. Um, and choir pa- practice always started on Wednesday evenings at 7.20 p.m. sharp, and most members arrived by 7.15. Oh. S- yeah, that's, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. Um, so historically, like everybody was there on time and usually five minutes before. So on Wednesday, March the 1st, 1950, at 725, the church exploded and Whoa. was completely destroyed. The blast was so intense that it forced a nearby radio station off the air and it shattered the windows in neighborhood homes that were close by. So this was you couldn't have survived this blast all 15 choir members were spared and the reason is because they were all late each for a different reason and i'm going to go through all the reasons because it's just incredible sorry how many were there again you said 15 15 15 15 15 so uh first of all the the minister reverend walter klempel his wife and his daughter, Marilyn Ruth, were supposed to leave at 7.10 to get to the church on time, but they found out at the last minute that Marilyn Ruth's dress was soiled, and so they waited while Mrs. Klempel ironed another so that they could have on their some Wednesday best, I guess, um, but they were still at home when the explosion occurred, so they were spared. Um... Another member, LaDona Vandergrift, a high school sophomore, was having trouble with a geometry problem, so she stayed home until she could finish it. Uh, Royena Estes, I'm probably butchering these names, but it was 1950, um, was ready, had but... Weird names back then? No, 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 it's just, yeah, I don't know if they're, they're probably not listening. Yeah. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Rowena was ready, but her car would not start. So she and her sister called Ladona Vandergrift and asked her to pick them up. But because she was the girl doing the geometry problem, they had to wait. So they were all spared. Um, Sadie Esta's story was basically the same. Um, basically, all day long, they'd have been having trouble with their car. It just refused to start. There was a Mrs. Leonard Schuster who ordinarily she arrived at 720 with her small daughter, Susan. But on this evening, she had to stay at her mother's house because she was helping her get ready for a missionary meeting. So she was late too. And then Herbert Kipf, K-I-P-F, um, he would have been uh, early, but actually he was taking a long time working on an important letter. And he said, quote, I can't think why but he lingered over it and was late. And it was cold outside on this evening. So Joyce Black, who was a stenographer, was, you know, said she was just feeling lazy and stayed inside until the last possible moment before going out in the cold. And she was almost ready to leave when the explosion occurred. Because his wife was away, machinist Harvey All was taking care of his two sons and he got up and he got caught up in conversation. When he looked at his watch, he saw that he was already late to church for choir practice. So they were all spared. Marilyn Paul, who was the pianist, planned to arrive half an hour early, but she fell asleep at dinner time. And when her mother woke her up at 7.15, she had to rush to get ready and leave. So she was spared. And then there was a Mrs. Paul, who was the, cr- the choir director and mother of the pianist, and she was late because her daughter was. Um, and then there were two high school girls, Lucille Jones and Dorothy Wood, and they were neighbors, and they usually went together, they were friends, and they were usually early. But on this particular evening, 
Lucille was listening to a radio program and wanted to hear the end, and it ended at 7.30. And her friend Dorothy had to wait for her. So all 15 people didn't die that day, and there was a different reason for each one. Wow, that's crazy. Isn't it crazy? And then firemen thought that the explosion had been caused by natural gas, which may have leaked into the church from a broken pipe. Um, but a lot of people obviously thought this was some kind of divine intervention. And they calculated the odds, and it was something like, for all 15 members being late and surviving this, it was one in one million odds. Wow, wow. That's crazy. Well, I, lo I love how all the... Um the things that made them late were like really mundane and yeah. like not not like oh at the last minute i got the, this phone call from a long last no it's like dude like forgot <laughs> it was like, right. fell asleep fell yeah. asleep oh, okay. like like yeah i mean certainly you can describe that as a meaningful coincidence right like right that, you know i mean i you know you certainly couldn't blame someone for for reading that as some sort of divine in intervention or some sort of intervention right something intentional but but there's clearly that also a can simply a connection between these people right like there's right. A, a meaningful connection there and that you know they all experience this thing together is is kind of crazy it's insane right you think of those like stories about like divine interventions like oh something told me not to get on the plane or premonitions it's usually like one person and then everyone dies and they're like glad i didn't get on the plane you know and what's not one person it was like all these people that so it's like yeah that maybe that in some way they're all kind of connected and they're right. so they're all feeding off each other's energy that there's like not an urgency to get there or something yeah like, maybe yeah maybe i mean like the like the young example right like whose whose moment in synchronicity was that was that young's was that hers or was it both of theirs together right interesting okay, okay. so i got one more okay cool so this one also deals with connectedness and it's the gym twins the gym um, twins okay i don't know if you've ever heard no. of, of the it's this isn't just incredible so basically, in 1940, twin boys, identical twins, they were three weeks old and they were put up for adoption in Ohio. They were adopted by separate families. One family, the Lewises, lived in Lima, Ohio, and the other, the Springers, lived in Pequa. Um, unknowingly, each family named their son James. So that's quite a coincidence right there. We could just say, okay that's pretty crazy they're twins they both get named james right but this was just the beginning of a series of uncanny coincidences so um they live their lives and in 1977 they're 37 one of the twins jim lewis um i don't know if they went by jim and james or, or whatever but um he set out to to find his twin calls him up they're talking on the phone they get to know each other and uh, they weren't reunited until um, 1979 when they were 39, but they learned a lot about each other first, apparently. So when they connected, they discovered how similar their lives had been. And the similarities, the similarities extended far, far beyond just like their names and their DNA. Okay. Both had childhood dogs named Toy. Whoa, In grades. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, isn't that? No, okay. that's crazy. No, like, you could be like, oh my God, there's the synchronicity. That's insane. Okay. In grade school, both were good at math and woodworking and not so hot at spelling. You could say, okay, gen that's right, genetics. Right, genetics yeah. right, but it gets weirder. Okay, okay. So both had been married twice. And in their first marriages, both had married women named Linda. Whoa. Okay. And both had left their first wives to marry women named Betty crazy okay both had sons and named them james allen and only one had spelled allen with an extra l both were heavy smokers and they both smoked salem cigarettes they both bit their nails they both took vacations to the same beach in florida they both drove the same chevrolet car and then they kind of had similar jobs. These are different, but it's it's pretty similar. Like one was in security and the other was a deputy sheriff. So they're in security jobs. And um, 
So they eventually took part in a study con conducted by Dr. Thomas Bouchard of the University of Minnesota, and he found that not only were their medical histories nearly identical, which you'd think, okay, genetically they're so similar, but their brainwaves and their personality tests were. Um, so, you know, a lot of people have, you know, since these studies like this one, a lot of people have speculated that um, their strange similarities point to telepathic communication that's possible between the twins. And that enabled this, like, really, like, oh, this right, heightened right, example right, of synchronicity right. happening. Oh, okay. So those are my stories. Wow, that was cool. Whoa, so, I mean, I mean, I feel like there was such a mix of coincidences in there. I mean, you know, some that, you know, like the whole name thing. I mean, this is one that kind of trips me out. Like, you know, um, there's some... I'm sure there's examples of how this is wrong, but there's a lot of like statistical examples of, um, you know, we tend to um, make friends with and have children and lovers and stuff with certain like first letters of names. And you have like this like crazy high likelihood if like they're the same letter as your name. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, a number of people in your lives might, you know, uh, um, you know, the, the first letter of the name might start with E. You know, two of my friends, his, him and his brother, both married someone named Aaron, right? <laughs> like, so right. Th there's this, like, it's, it's some statistical weirdness, right? Just about how the world is constructed. And I just think it's so, like, I don't know. I feel like the, like, whatever game logic this world is, like, built around, or, you know, or whatever, or energy currents or whatever, however you want to describe it, that... You know, it's it's a little bit less. I mean, it's very complex, but it's it's almost less complex in a way. You know, than we than we think. You know, with with things like genetics, and you know, they say that you know people with certain first names go into certain fields and stuff like that. That there's some pattern back there behind everything. I that yes, but I just have, I don't know. I, I can accept that argument to a certain extent, but when you get into they both married Linda's and then they both left their wives for Betty's. I mean, it well, just gets the... too weird to be able to be just a random coincidence. It's just, Oh, totally. Yeah. That's too what I'm saying. Much. I don't think it's And, at, and at, all, at yeah. that point, then I, I kind of start to feel like, well, maybe there is something to, you know, th there was something telepathic going on. Totally. Um, and I don't know, like, maybe we should like talk about some of the uh, theories about synchronicity and like why it happens and, and what it, I mean, I, obviously the first one is just straight up materialistic explanation. It's random coincidence. You do things enough times and you're going to end up with this, you know, like, you know, something aligning. Yep. Yeah, I but mean, that's not fun. <laughs> no, that's not fun. <laughs> but but also like something like this, like well, it's very contrary. You really too. have to, yeah, and also you like really have to stretch. Yeah, the limits of belief to to like I don't know in in some of these stories. Well, I mean, it's 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 a very quick dive then into like what you know existentialism, right? So if you're you know if you're like oh well it's just all random coincidence and it's like well then yeah we see the you know what we see of the world is what we happen to be seeing right and. And so then our lives are sort of defined by that. But then that, that doesn't, I don't know, you could easily turn that around into an argument for it, right? If, the, if we're just seeing that, then that's significant too. Like if that's, mm -hmm. you know, one of the examples that's given a synchronicity a lot is, oh, you think, uh, you know, this happened to me literally just the other morning. You think of somebody and then you see them on the street, right? And granted, you bump into people, in, you know, on the street in New York, you know, or Manhattan, but it's it's rare, you know, especially when you haven't seen someone for a while and then you just happen to bump into them. You know, that's an example of one. But you could argue, oh, well, you just happen to notice them because you were thinking of them, right? Right. So, I mean... And there's a lot of that. I mean, we look for patterns. Right, right. The brain looks for patterns. Totally. But, like, Jung's, one of Jung's explanations about it was that, um, and there's certainly physics to back this up, right, that... It's all energy. We're all energy, mm -hmm. right? If you mm -hmm. zoom in, you know, on the particles that make up everything, there's yes. no difference between the particles in our body and the particles of the table and the particles of the air. It's literally matter of perception. And so if everything is energetic, certainly those energies can influence each other in a world in which we cannot see, right? The world in right. which that, you know, the senses maybe can't penetrate that easily. 
Right. And I think like, okay, we need to do another episode on this and maybe have a guest on since <laughs> it's so complex. But um, the idea of quantum entanglement yeah, and right, right, some right, of the theories right. put forth in quantum physics, uh, basically, as I, you know, as I understand it, if you split electrons um, that were somehow bound together, yeah, there's some like you can entangle the part these particles, right? And they actually use this in quantum computing, believe it or not, right? So this is not just a theory. This is actually something that you can do. And they actually have quantum computers now where you you can you can go on the internet basically and, and feed them problems. And the, how you activate these computers is like sort of like command lines and stuff. And like IBM has some of these online. I think Google does as well. You literally entangle the particles and you use those two entangled particles then to help you do these computations that otherwise like a very purely linear computer couldn't do in a certain amount of time. Well, well but this other, this quantum entanglement um, notion is basically like if you split Dif if you split particles, even if there's a vast distance between them, right, right, you put them on the other sides of the planet, they would still. And you observe one. Whatever you do to the one will be instantly reflected in the other one. Right. And Einstein called this um, spooky action at a distance. And basically, it, it it defies logic. It defies the the known laws of physics. Because it's faster than the speed of light. It's instantaneous. Oh, right. Interesting. Right, right. So somehow they're connected. Right. In some and way it's almost like, are we light. looking at things in a... I mean, like, there, then this brings up the whole, like, holographic uni universe theory. Um, hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting that what you were saying about, um, you know, observation, you know, this idea that when we look at something, literally the phenomena changes. Right. Right. Which is kind of a mind blowing idea, right? Like I think Plato talked about it. Like when you look at a tree, the tree changes. Like just this idea that we are we are a direct influence on our environment. Right. And so yeah, a very flat way to say it is like, oh well, you know, if you're expecting to see something and you see it, it's your mind sort of attracting it. But at the same time, like we literally do in a very real way uh, um, create the world in which we see, right? The way we perceive the world is an extension of us observing it in a way, right? And so I think there, there, there's got to be some connection to this idea of synchronicity in there, right? Just that, this idea that like our mental state, how we look at the world uh, is going to have an effect on how the world is for us, right? That's, I mean, that's kind of a mind-blowing idea, right? And that if you are thinking about somebody, yeah, maybe you notice them when they're crossing the street more, but maybe they take a route, you know, that right. because on some really subconscious level or energetic level, they feel a, a drawing towards you or something. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. You know, I mean, that's not that crazy. That's not cr that crazy of a thought. I mean, I certainly right. have had friends that you feel things about them at a distance, right? I mean, I feel like everyone's had that experience to some degree. Everyone has had that, I think. I think that's like one of the most common ones. Right. You know, like thinking of someone and then they call. Um, but there are different theories to explain why that happens, uh -huh. you know? And I mean, one of the more interesting ones that I came across was um, that it, it basically took the multiverse theory and basically said that yes, every single outcome that you can imagine actually exists simultaneously. So basically, when you're thinking about someone or when you have like a strong emotion towards something or you're directing your energy towards something, you're sort of steering it into this other dimension. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. And that accounts for right. synchronicity. Right. That um, I mean, I, I was raised in a religious household, and my mom was strongly Christian, and, you know, she would say, well, that's God, you know, and she had countless things happen that she would attribute to God. So, you know, there are different ways of explaining this, 
and why it happens. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's a very like profound way of thinking about it, like that there's all these possible lives happening and that you can be drawn into one by where your consciousness is oriented, basically. And but this idea of God, too, that um, uh, Julia Cameron, back to the sort of artist way and how she looked at it, um, she actually, you know, she knew a lot of for a lot of artists, this idea of God was button pushing. You know, so she right. So she course. would uh, describe it as good orderly direction. And so she said mm-hmm. when you're really connected to this artistic, this creative process or this sort of artistic goal that you would sort of draw things towards you. Right. Like if you, you know, I mean, I've certainly had this experience where you decide you want to do this certain type of project and then out of the blue you meet and you need someone to help help you do it. And like all of a sudden you meet that person. Right. There is something about that. um, Right. That's real. And that in, in when we're more in a more sort of passive place or a less a place where we're experiencing life in a less meaningful way, those experiences, either we don't see them or they don't happen as much. But either way. Like they, they don't, um, we don't participate in that sort of, I don't know, movement of the universe. Right. I mean, I feel like there's like kind of like an American shallow take on that, which is kind of like, okay, I'm going to do my vision board and I'll get my Mcmansion, you know, and my business will take off and I'll be rich. And, you know, I just, yeah, I well, want all been... these things and the universe is just waiting to give them to me, you know, but um, I mean, all kind all, of like there's yeah. something too, like where you put your energy and where you put your focus. No, there's certainly some to it. There's I mean, something mysterious that can happen there, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think all, all these people, like they're all, you know, that you're, you're you're talking about specifically, like the the secret and all that, are definitely people that, um, you know, the, they're not original thinkers. They stole an idea from somewhere, uh, and they used it to sort of trick people into giving them money, right? But that doesn't mean the idea, uh, you know, at, at heart isn't isn't there isn't some truth to it, right? They've bastardized it, they've watered it down, they've made it more palatable, or they've oriented around this idea marketable. of making marketable. Yeah. You know, there's certainly charlatans in in the world in which they're sort of positing they move through, but that doesn't mean that that idea didn't come from somewhere much different than them. Do you know what right. I mean? And so. Right. And I, th- I feel like a lot of ideas like that in, in this world get a bad rap because we sort of find the worst examples of them, right, uh, um, as a representation of, you know, those ideas. Like, people get so mad nowadays when people walk around saying, like, namaste, and people are, like, mad at, like, hippies because they want peace, but... People have always been mad at hippies. I know. I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why people are so mad at hippies. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening right now. Shout about how they do we really want to have this conversation (laughs) (laughs) but it's like what's wrong with this idea like peace and stuff i I don't know it's just such an odd thing to object i don't think there's anything wrong with i don't think people object to peace i think people object to people saying it fakeness right yeah but still wouldn't you rather have someone being phony about talking about peace than i don't i don't know i don't know i guess that's a whole other topic than being a complete dick yeah 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 exactly i don't know um but anyways, um, well, those were some really good stories. I feel like I want to do an episode um, about quantum physics that we don't prepare for and we just make stuff up the whole time. What do you think about that? Oh, my that? God. <laughs> I don't think anyone would want to listen to that. I don't know. I think it'd be pretty funny now. No, but we should do one where at least, like, try and grapple with I mean, there's, like, like that string theory okay. and stuff. It's so it's, hard to, like... It is really hard. But it, I feel like but, it's but worth it. But it's so fascinating. Yeah, it is fascinating. Um, okay. Well, I just want to ask you, Seth, like, what yeah. do you, th- what, I mean, we've talked about like, kind of like a range of different explanations for synchronicity. What do you believe? Um, I believe that, um, we do attract things into our lives. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and we, we shouldn't use that idea to like beat ourselves up with like, if something like we'd sort of describe as like bad happening, it's not like, because we are bad and we deserve bad things. It's more that, I think that when we're, like I said before, when we're feeling, when we're connected with something more meaningful in our lives, then other things like that will be sort of drawn towards it. And so I think there's, I think it's described somewhere as a law of attraction. And I think it is a type of law. And I think it's deeply psychological, 
right? I think there is a spiritual aspect of it. I think that we do live in a creative world and I think that we do live in Maya. <laughs> you know, we do live in a, a world largely created by our perception of it. And so, you know, changing our mind can can change that perception in a very real way, you know? And so, um, you know, I think it is certainly possible. I mean, we've, you know, it's, it's, it's another one of those um, phenomena that you can't really, you're not going to talk somebody into it, right? You're either going to experience it and feel the reality of it for yourself, or you're not. You're going to be like, oh, no, it's just random, and you're just seeing those things there. That's fine. That's, you know, like, I'm not going to, like, try and, like, talk somebody into that. But I know that, you know, um, you know, I know my experiences with it. And I do like how, in you know, um, back to Julia Cameron just one more time, that, you know, this idea that, you know, le- if you leap, uh, a, a net will appear is a very sort of practical way to look at, at, at something like synchronicity or, or this idea of law of attraction, right? That it can be a powerful thing where it's like, I don't know. And I've, you know, I'm sure you've experienced this too. Like even this ex- that adventure, we don't know where this is going to lead. But, um, you know, there's something about going for it and seeing what happens and, and things tend to fall into place when you do that. Um, right. So what, what do you think? Well, I think I take more of the like smorgasbord approach. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I okay. definitely think, yeah, I mean, and I mentioned this earlier, having been raised in like, you know, with a, a pretty strong religious upbringing, I had to rebel against that. And so I had to go completely like, okay. You know, it's all logic. It's, you know, nothing gets past this barrier, you Mm -hmm, know, and mm -hmm. and be very strong. But I basically come around to being more open and realize that I do have some faith, but I still think it's really important to be skeptical. So I think that, you know, human nature, we want to see patterns. We want to feel special. We want to feel noticed and loved and you know, I, I think that sometimes it's wishful thinking, but for some of, you know, some experiences like this, I just think that, you know, logic fails. And so I do really think that there is um, a power when you focus your energy and who you are, you know, what what's really true for you on a goal or on something that you really want, or I've noticed in this myself, if there's something that I really love or someone I really love, you'll kind of move toward it, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and and I also think I'm, I'm open to the possibility that there's, you know, something like divine intervention, you know, something else out there that can intervene in your life and you know, give you signs. I'm open to that. Yeah, me too. Me too. And and we don't even know what, you know, an intervention would be like, we, you know, I feel like whenever that question comes up, you know, either someone might try to muscle that into, well, it was definitely a Christian God and blah, 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 you know, like versus like, well, we don't know what it is. You know what I mean? We don't know, but, but it's certainly an experience, right? It, like, how do you explain that? that event with these people right maybe it is is just mathematics but maybe there's even god in those mathematics right like when you think about probabilities right like all the insanity that must be happening out there in the universe uh, you know must be like mind-blowing right just just talking about mathematics right you said there's one in one million or whatever the chances were that all that all that would happen and so you know i think there's something to that and and you know who knows? It could be other people and, you know, it could be ourselves intervening with ourselves. Do you know what I mean? Like, we don't really know what, what, what that means, but we do know the feeling that it elicits, right? And this this is what I think, like, the takeaway for me is, is that it's fun to talk about this. And it's like, you know, it, I think it does help us sort of understand and relate to each other and stuff. But at the end of the day, like, why step on your own experience of it? You know, if you have that feeling of like, oh, my God, like when I read that thing about Sir Victor Goddard today, like I had an experience, right? Like I was like, mm-hmm. wow, that's crazy. That's cool. Like th- I felt something in there. Sure. That's you could certainly chalk that up to like a certain math problem or something, you know, <laughs> like a certain probability of that happening. Um, but for me, that was an interesting connection. And so 
you know, I took that for what it was worth in my own experience. And, and to some degree, like, why question it at that level, at the level right. of your own experience? Yeah. And I feel like something, you know, sometimes I take it personally, it feels a little bit like a sign that I'm on the right track. Uh huh. Yeah. And I mean, you know, when we have those feelings, like, why wouldn't, why wouldn't it be? You know what I mean? I think we're so afraid of being wrong. Right. You know, that at the end of our lives, we're like, well, there's no God, so you were fucking stupid the whole time. Like, you know, like, we're afraid to put ourselves does on the Does it line. really matter, though, at the <laughs> right. end? Well, that's what I'm you saying. Know? It doesn't really matter, right? What what mm-hmm. matters is, I think, that that existentialistic point of view where it's like, hey, we, we are creating our lives, so why not try to, <laughs> you know, like, pursue one in which we allow for these experiences to be what they are for us. And yeah. not try I tried, to see yeah. Adams and I tried to go very it. hard line for a while, and it didn't work out for me. Was there was there a, a, a scarab brooch moment? There was no scarab, <laughs> but I just I you know actually what kind of um, drew me back into more of a spiritual orbit is just that I realized I'm just so strongly interested in all of this stuff. I couldn't get away from it. Right, and you were I, just just despite whatever. Mm-hmm. reasoning you had, you still had a feeling towards it. Yep. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, good. This was this was a good one. I wasn't sure how it was going to go. Like, you know, it was much more of a discussion, I feel like, this yeah, time. Yeah, we got, we got way... We got we into got pretty it. pretty philosophical. Yeah. <laughs> we cracked some quantum physics in there. Figured yeah, out. I really tried. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, was, I think it was good. I think it was good. Um, cool. Well, that's that's... Episode five, right? Episode five. And so I got five I, yeah, under our belt. I'm not sure what we're doing. I mean, we have some ideas of stuff we're, we're coming up, but we're always also looking for people's stories too. So any any stories you would think would interest us or interest other people, um, we're still collecting them. What was the email address again? Shadowlandpodcast at gmail dot com. Okay, I probably should have remembered that, <laughs> but um, but yeah, Seth. Yes, uh, but yeah, we're. I think we're gonna do. We're gonna do um some coming up, maybe on trolls. <laughs> I don't know how that one landed in there, but we totally need to do trolls. Trolls. It's um, a challenge. Trolls are a challenge. I can't remember the other ones we were talking about for September, but I think we have some good ones. Okay, and then we might have some um fun stuff coming up for October. So. Actually, we will have some fun stuff coming yes. up for October. Where yep. It's going to be known as Spooktober. Spooktober. All right. Around here. <laughs> cool. All and right. Send us your stories. Send us your Please, stories. If you have really cool synchronicity stories, we'd yep. love to hear them. I think we should do an episode with listener stories and throw in some of our own. Yeah, we, yeah. Both you and I have had experiences. So. Totally. I think that's a great idea. All right. So I guess until next time. All right. See you later. Okay. Bye.